Good morning. You're listening to Live with Lou. And uh, we're for real today. We're actually live, really live, not recorded live, not like fresh frozen, but we're, uh, we're here. And we are out here in eastern Yuba County in the state of Jefferson. We're up here on Mount Hooth today, and we're broadcasting for the Patriot, 1410 AM, if you care to know the numbers. But I think we're supposed to say that every once in a while. But if you'd like to uh, listen to us in another fashion, say if you're out there in distant Butte County or Nevada County or Placer, Calusa, and it's a little scratchy, the reception, you can go on to the website at kmycradio.com and click on the listen live icon there, kmycradio.com. And it should be loud and clear if our live stream is working. If we have problems in the transmission today, uh, you could go to hear a recorded version that is loud and clear on One Eye Blind Media. That's on YouTube. So you just bring up YouTube on your computer and then uh, type out One Eye Blind Media with space in between each word and then just look for Live with Lou and pick out which uh, show you want to listen to. And you can listen to it anytime you want and in little portions or big portions and you can just have a happy day. So we are part of the Obama resistance. Obama still is undermining uh, the president of the United States. And if you watch the, the State of the Union message, I was just, I didn't get to watch, I don't have a television, but uh, I watched some of it on YouTube and I was amazed were you amazed like wh- whatever flavor you are politically were you amazed at things that uh i thought were pretty cool like the fact that we're gonna make a better effort of fighting opioid abuse or like things that we used to all like like standing up for the honoring of the flag and the national anthem or the fact that we're going to that millions of people are getting a thousand or fifteen hundred or two thousand dollar bonuses or the lowest black and Hispanic employment unemployment uh, in history and establishing merit based immigration and two point four million jobs created in the last year uh, and a number of other things that were like in God things like in God we trust focusing on God. And that the Democrats, and particularly the blacks, I thought were fascinating, the black caucus, just sat there as if they disapproved of everything, just had a big sourpuss on their face. If I would have been like that at my mother's table, she would have jack slapped me right off the chair. Right? Oh, my God. I could never have that kind of attitude in my house where I was raised. My goodness. So I thought it was really telling the attitude of true black leadership, for instance. And you can look at that at the Democrat leadership in general, the white leadership. But with all the talk over decades of, oh, blacks this and blacks that, and the reason we have black unemployment, all of this racism and this, that, and the other thing. And all of a sudden, the employment rate, all of a sudden, they're going to work like they've never gone to work before. And we're not happy about it. No claps, no smiles, just old sour pusses. Man. No support of the national anthem. Remember, people started chanting, you see old uh, Gutierrez get up and stomp out when they started chanting USA. said, man, we don't want nothing about the USA. Nothing good to happen here. Border security. No, we're not interested in border security. American flag? No, we just like, you know, I get a kick out of the DACA. I just had a uh, a chat with a family that their child is at Yuba City High School, and and she's got to write an English essay on DACA. And she said all her friends are for DACA. I said, well, the reason they are because they don't know their butt from a hole in the ground over there. Neither does the teacher. The teacher's fresh out of college. And this student's going to be, actually, after I got done with this student, she knows more than teacher at this point about DACA. 
But uh, I was fascinated that uh, they're going to write – this uh, article about DACA and nobody even knows what they're talking about in that class, certainly not the students. And so I, I read this somewhere, I heard it somewhere. I thought it was a good analogy. I was telling this family uh, on the phone the other night, uh, a good analogy on DACA is if you're coming home from work and you drive up into your driveway and law enforcement's there and your doors open and they're inside and they've apprehended someone, an adult, inside and has a pillowcase full of your any money that you had around like your recent payroll check and some of your jewelry and some of your most more you know uh, valuable items and with the father or the mother is a child a 10 year old child and they arrest the child arrest the, the father they don't arrest a child like, hey, the child's just along for the ride, right? But when they go to court, the court finds them. Uh, they're not going to prosecute the, the adult. And not only that, they send the adult and the child back to your house, and you're mandated to move them in with you, and you have to pay all their expenses for the rest of their life. Now, that's DACA. In other words, the person committed a crime to steal from you. In other words, Back in the early 1900s, anybody that could figure out how to get to the United States and go through the proper immigration clearance uh, could come here. There were no quotas or anything. But the big difference from, from then to now is that there were no benefits here other than opportunity. There was no welfare. There was no Section 8 housing. There was no free medical. There was no guaranteed job. There was no free education. So if you came here, your hope was that you, you knew someone and somebody maybe would sponsor you and take you. In other words, sponsoring back then meant not just like I want them here, but, but they actually took them into their homes and took care of them until they could get on their feet. So you, you remember hearing these stories where, Somebody says, I came to America. I had 50 cents in my pocket. Well, you wonder, how'd they pull that off? Well, because there was no government aid. There was no freebies. So the only reason you'd want to come to America is, say, freedom and freedom from violence or political anarchy, possibility of a, a new start in life, a job. And so people came here, and their friends helped them for a bit until they could get on their feet. Those who couldn't get on their feet, say they were lazy, uh, or they had a bad attitude, they soon were not going to receive the hospitable attitude of their friends, and they probably got on a boat and went back to Europe or wherever they came from. That's how it was back then. So now it's a big difference when – a person can break into this country. Like I asked this family last night, I said, I don't know how you guys operate over there. Do you lock your doors when you go to sleep at night? They said, oh, definitely. I said, why do you do that? They said, well, you know, we don't want anybody to come in like unbeknownst to us and assaulting us or stealing from us. And I said, okay. So I said, the border's no different than the front door to your house. It's like if somebody knocks on your door, in the middle of the night rings your doorbell, you go to the door and you try to help them, right? Or figure out what they need. But they just don't come in and just take over. And that's what DACA is, and that's what open border immigration is. In other words, when President Trump says we're gonna have a we're gonna have a great big we're gonna have a wall, but we want a great big beautiful door or gateway for people to come in legitimately, right? It's just like uh the same thing with your house. So you have a right to determine what kind of country. Do you want Muslims to come in and establish Sharia law in their neighborhoods and not allow you to come into their neighborhoods or beat up on your people or rape your kids, right? Which is what's happening in some parts of the country. where, And so why would you want somebody to come in here if they don't want to assimilate into the culture and they want to establish their own country within a culture. I get a kick out of folks protesting for DACA and they 
they're flipping you the bird and doing F-U-C-K Trump and flying the Mexican flag or the San Salvador flag or something, something. I thought, why would you want to come to America and become an American when you want to have your flag over your house? I think the answer is they don't want America the way America is. They just want to free everything. In other words, they think we deserve free stuff. Like out at Yuba College, this family who actually works for a living gets none of the free benefits of school or anything. They pay taxes, but they don't get free lunch or anything like that. If their child, one of their kids is out at Yuba College, and uh, he doesn't get all the free stuff like DACA kids do, right? Uh, or DACA adults. Some, you can be up to 31 years of, old, old, of age and be in this DACA group. Now, I have some articles, I don't know what I get to them today, of DACA, DACA uh, benefit people smuggling people across the border. They're arresting one after another after another. They're involved in what they call, that's called human tra- trafficking. So anyway, my young female friend at Yuba City High School is going to write her article on that, and her dad happens to be an immigrant who came in legally and got jacked around by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and ended up spending about fifty grand to, even though he owned a couple businesses, had a couple, about 20 employees, and pays all kinds of taxes, works his rear off, and has a big family, and yet he couldn't get his immigration uh, sorted out after his schooling here to become a doctor and had to hire one of the top firms in the United States of America. Incredible. It's just, you know, I was, I, I don't know I mentioned this last week, but I was on my way back from Vietnam and I was sitting next to a Viet, Vietnamese young woman and then an older woman next to the window. I was on the aisle. So I asked this Vietnamese girl, I could tell she could speak a little English cause I, I, I lifted her luggage up into the overhead and she responded in English. So I said, Oh, where are you headed? And we were going to Tai pay Taiwan to hit a hub there and go different directions. And she said, Oh, I'm going to Toronto, Canada. And I said, Oh, why would you want to go there? And she said, I'm going to school there. I said, Oh, do they have a special training or special program or department that you're interested in? She said, no, I wanted to go to the United States, but they rejected my visa. And she, and she was from an area of Vietnam in, in the city of Saigon, District 6, which is uh, well off. And uh, there are certain areas, just like in America, where people that are very successful, make a lot of money, live. So she had the money to come in here and, and pay foreign tuition to a university, would pay her own way, absolutely, and would go back to her homeland to work and didn't want anything from the United States, but the education. And we rejected her, but we would take in a non English speaking, illiterate person who has no skills, never graduated from high school. And then we're put him on the welfare dole. The only people that would ever want to do that would be Democrats because they want that vote. For instance, if for some reason, all of these lawbreakers were going to vote Republican the Democrats would build the wall. Hold that thought. Well, I read this this week. I just thought it was a great thing. It was, it's, a, it's a comment by a guy named Robert Heinlein, and I don't even know this guy, but I thought, oh, I like this comment. He said, the United States has become a place where entertainers and professional athletes are mistaken for people of importance. Hold that thought as the Super Bowl cranks up tomorrow, right? Did you, did you realize, Wookie Man, that uh, a lot of these guys on the Philadelphia Eagles are Christian guys? Did you know that, that the quarterback is going to be, wants to be a youth pastor? Did you know that? You're holding out on me, dude. I thought you were supposed to inform me all this stuff. I had to stumble across that myself. I, and then I was on Facebook, and there's another guy. That I don't even know the position of these some of these guys because I don't follow football. Uh, much anymore. And, uh, this guy was saying, Hey, my whole life got changed last March in this football team. He said, I kind of knew about God, but he said, there's a number of people on this team that are really helping us. And he said, I was going through a lot of difficulties in my life. And he said, I, I really committed my life to Christ. And, uh, 
things are going good for me right now, and I'm learning how to uh, trust God in the midst of the ups and downs of athletics. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So, you know, at, at these Super Bowl, Bowls, there's all these side side lights or, you know, sub-dramas that you hear about these people. It's kind of interesting, kind of like the Olympics when they start telling the personal stories of these Olympic athletes. It's always fun to listen to. Well, uh, we're glad you're listening. And uh, let's see, I think I told you all the spots you can listen. You can call us up if you want, 742 and all fives after that. 742, all fives. It's 530 area code. You can call if you want. It is a pro-choice uh, program, so we may have to abort the call if you're not convenient or we think it's going to have a uh, a smothering effect on my career. So uh, we may have to abort it, or you may, you know, let Wikiman talk to you and see what you're up to, and you could pass it on to me. So anyway, I I got lectured and cussed at this last week because I cussed on the air because I used the S word. Remember the S hole? They've been talking about S-H-I-T hole all over the news. Thousands of times they commented. It's like I made that comment. So I'm not going to use that comment this week. <clears throat> so I wanted to mention to you that there, oh, this is a cool thing. This is a cool thing. Uh, I went on, I stumbled across this, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. You can Google this. And they'll, they'll, you know, there's a thing called Prop 13. And in the late 70s, there was a Proposition 13 went on the ballot because every year the property values were going so up so fast in California that assessors would just say they'd reassess your property. And they'd say, well, this is your tax. And then the next year they'd say, no, this is your tax. And next year they'd say, this is your tax. And they just arbitrarily raise, raise your rates. And they would say, well, that's what the value of your house is now if you sold it. And so a lot of older people in California could not afford their house anymore after they paid for it and lived there, these senior citizens, and their their taxes were doubling and tripling. So there was a Prop 13 where people voted that they limited it. It put a restraint on how much your tax base, the tax base of your house could go up each year, and they limited it to 2% of the value. So this cool thing on the Howard Jarvis uh, it, this is in on an article or on their website, <laughs> it estimates your prop 13 savings. It's really cool. So in 1978, if it, that was your purchase year and you bought a house for $70,890, you would have saved $6,116 every year up to this year, which would ac- accumulated would be $238,511. That's Prop 13. If you hear people wanting to change Prop 13, you need to get all lathered up and freaked out about it. Now, check this out. In 1987, where the median price in in housing was $142,000, I bought my house in 1987, and, and I didn't pay anything close to that. I couldn't afford that. So the average savings from 87 forward was $6,066, but you would save 181000 So anyway, I figured what my house would have been in 1987. And I saved up up since 1987 to now, I saved the equivalent amount of I paid for my whole house. Isn't that amazing? That's pretty cool. These are huge savings. And so, and, and it takes the median, you can figure your own house and, and just adjust it, but it gives the median price of a house for each year, 78 up through 1996, I think. No, no, it goes all the way up to 2016. So, uh, and then it tells how much per year you saved and then how much accumulated you saved. So I just want to tell you, you need to go check this out because out of all the things that's been done in California, that's been positive, which aren't, aren't a lot. The weather is the most positive thing, but everything else politically is pretty screwed up, including the perverts in in Sacramento. But I'm telling you this prop 13 is a massive savings for homeowners. And uh, if anything comes up that they want to put a bill through to change it, you need to fight, 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 lean to the left, lean to the right, fight, fight, fight. Okay. So that's Howard Jarvis. Now the cool thing is 
is that a representative for Howard Jarvis is coming up Monday night. And this guy, David Wolf, is going to be at the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots uh, at 6. The meeting starts at 630. You can get there at 6. And David Wolf can answer all these questions about Prop 13. And here's the other thing that's really right in our face right now. Yuba County is going to try to raise sales tax 1%, just like Marysville did. And they're saying that if we don't, we won't be able to have any police and fire. They're, they're liars is what they are. And they want more money to pay pensions. Is that their, their problem is pensions, but they're going to blame it on police and fire. We just can't afford to pay police and fire, but they'll, they'll tell you whether you need to put a hat on if the sun comes out or whether you need a condom or, or all that kind of stuff, or whether you should drink more water or less water stuff that you could figure out on your own. We're paying people $150,000 a year to tell us that. So David Wolf is going to be there, and we need to talk to David Wolf about how can we fight this 1% tax because they lie and cheat, and uh, we need some help. So David Wolf's going to be at the Sutter Beach Tea Party on February 5th. That's Monday night at Church of Glad Tidings, 1179 Eager Road or Highway 99 at Eager. And uh, it's free. You don't need to belong. You can just dip in. And this guy has been 11 years with Howard Jarvis, so he knows what's shaking down there. And uh, he's going to talk about the protections of Prop 13 and how we need to fight for it and how the government is trying. In fact, Governor Brown just said that the reason the state is in financial trouble isn't because of misspending. It's because of Prop 13. Hold that thought. I think we're going to come right back after Wikiman gives us some other information. new meaning to the term first responders. Fellow community members stepping forward, volunteering their time to help others faced with what might be some of the most traumatic incidents in their lives. It's called the Trauma Intervention Program, or TIP. It's been used in communities across the United States for years, and its volunteers have been dispatched to provide what they call emotional first aid. A collaboration between police, paramedics, fire departments, and even hospital staff is making sure residents are emotional taken care of in a time of crisis. Residents are volunteering their time with the Trauma Intervention Program, or TIP, dispatched to the scene of a fire, accident, or death to focus on the emotional needs of those left behind. It's just being there and being comforting, like a good friend or an extension of your family. Ready to assist, sit, and listen to community members in a time of tragedy. To learn more about the Trauma Intervention Program, visit yubasuttertip.org or call 673-9300. All right, welcome back. You're listening to Lou Benninger live with Lou. And we're going to be here till noon. And this is our second half hour. So I just want to make a couple of com- more comments about Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots. Uh, at the event coming up, uh, you can actually help them. They have a raffle, a 50-50 raffle. You know what that is? I, I don't know a lot of the – I've kind of stumbled across the information on these. That's when you – you uh, buy raffle tickets and then somebody wins and they split the pot, right? So Sutter Beach keeps half, you get half. Pretty good deal if you want to. You're probably better off there than trying to work the lottery. So for you, Yuba County folks that are facing a 1% sales tax increase, that's huge, you know. Like if you go out and buy a $40,000 car, that's going to be four, another $400 to the county. Uh, it amounts. It amounts up. It adds up. So uh, my friend, Dr. Cassidy bought a car the other day and he bought a used vehicle and he bought, I think it's, he said he spent 30,000 pickup from a friend of his. So he went to reg, he went to th- AAA where he belongs as a uh, insurance guy. I mean, that's his insurer. And so they will, you can pay your DMV fees there and pay your use tax or what they call use tax or sales tax there. And so when they asked for the money and they showed him the receipt because he listens to this program and he knew that he has a nine, five, nine, zero one area code or zip code. And I warn people that if you're in a nine, five, nine, zero one zip code, which is Marysville, but if you're out in Linda, what we normally call East Linda, for instance, 
you're going to have that same zip code and there's a chance that you'll get charged an extra 1% sales tax, even though you don't live in Marysville. So anyway, when they came back and he, after he paid the money or whatever, and he looked, he said, Hey, wait a minute, this is wrong. And they said, no, it's right. No, it's wrong. No, it's right. No, it's wrong. He said, I don't live in Marysville. I live in Linda. Well, that area code gets an extra 1%. So they said, the only way you're going to be able to get this back is to go to the state board of equalization. And he had, and so his wife said, just forget it. So it was like $300 or something. Right. And, uh, so he said, Hey, it's a lot of money. Maybe it was a $15,000 truck and it was $150. Anyway, whatever it is, it's a lot of money. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, his wife said, Joe, it's just going to be a pain in the rear to try to get the money from the state of California. So he said, I'm going to apply for it. So he went to the DMV and they said, fill out this form. In other words, you people just can't sort it out. Right. And just give you your darn money back. So he had to apply for it, submit it. He did get a check back, but that's how screwed up everything is. So it amounts to a lot of money. So you ought to go to this Howard Jarvis, uh, speaker, David Wolf and, and talk to him about a strategy for you that want to fight this. You should go to that meeting and he's liable. I don't know whether David is an attorney or not, but they have Howard Jarvis attorneys that work on these sales tax fights and we need their help to fight, uh, Yuba County. Marysville screwed us, the city of Marysville. They lied to us. They manipulated. They, they're, it's against the law for the city council to promote and get behind and, and, uh, do PR work for a tax like that. So what they did is hired, they had, uh, they made a sweetheart deal with David Lanza, who is he and his dad are investors in the community he has a lot of property. And he went out and spent the money and fought the thing to raise taxes here. He paid all the money. He did all the work. And then they turned around and gave him a dispensary deal in his property. See how that works. Well, I, I want to mention here, I, I missed this. I, I never do get around to everything I want to talk about, but I wanted to go back a couple weeks ago. I know it was just a little over a week ago, I guess. My friend was on the front page of the appeal Democrat. His name is Doug Eshman. And he's been the principal at Mary Covalot elementary school. I don't know. I don't know. He's got 20 years it says in the article, Chris Kaufman did the photograph and, and he wrote the article. Chris does a good job for the appeal Democrat. And it's a very complimentary article about Doug Eshman. I wonder every year I wonder, is Doug going to retire? Cause he's, I think he's in his seventies and he lives up in Clipper mills and commutes every day, all the way down to Marysville. I met him during the flood. I was it the 97 flood or 96. I always get the years mixed up, but anyway, we were unloading a, uh, tractor trailer rig stuff with food out at uh, Oliver's for the flood victims. And we were dumping it off out at, uh, Yuba gardens. And Doug was a vice principal out there. We got to know each other and then he got transferred to Mary Kovalot and we started to working together to help that school, which was, I call it an armpit school. It, they were a lot of kids in and out of that school. Parents weren't really settled in Marysville. There were kids that were living in homeless shelters, the depot in the river bottom, da, da, da. Anyway, it was the, for Democrats. That's the perfect excuse to have crappy scores. So Doug came in there and started to build a world-class, uh, all-star teacher team and, and change the place around. So they didn't have any money. So the church I was involved with same one I'm involved in now glad tidings, they didn't have any money to paint the school and it was really crummy. So we went over and I got a, uh, uh, an, a design person, Dan Desmond, Dan Desmond design. He picked the colors and we painted this school really cool. Did the whole school painted the whole school uh, with volunteers. And then we painted murals and did everything. We started programs like character, character counts programs, teaching with volunteers. Anyway, uh, in a very short time, the kids scores, uh, began to lead Yuba County of all elementary schools. It's a K through five school. And they have about 500 kids in that school. Now, the interesting thing, this is the two things I'm going to bring up. Chris missed, uh, he didn't miss it. I mean, he just probably never thought to ask. 
But about half of, because when you go to downtown Marysville, there aren't many kids in downtown Marysville. You think, well, where are all these kids come from? 500 kids in this little school in downtown Marysville, most of it's businesses, right? Or old people like me. Kids are long gone and they, they, they don't, you know, they're long gone. So anyway, about 50% of the kids that attend Mary Kovlod school are transfers. They come from other parts of Yuba County or they come from Sutter County. Can you imagine? And so when Doug retires and they put it just an average principal in there and the school goes back to the way it used to be, which is lousy scores, those students will no longer come to that school and you'll have a school that's built for 500 with only 200 kids in it, right? We have that problem up in Dobbins where I, I was involved in helping the Yes Charter School stay alive, but the Dobbins School, my understanding was the last I looked, they only had 50 children in it. This is a major campus that they remodeled and spent millions of dollars in in the last 10 years, and they only have 50 kids. Do you think that's going to pencil out financially? So when Doug leaves and they just get a normal principal and they just do the normal union stuff and the the, the – school returns to crap uh they're going to be going broke over there because they, no, they don't have enough butts in the seats now the interesting thing about mary kovlod that no one's really talking about but me you remember when if you live in in the city of marysville or maybe the district of marysville joint unified school district we passed or you passed some bonds i didn't vote for them ridiculously expensive bonds school bonds right and they were to because they didn't have any money to put up new buildings because these buildings were all ancient so they did, did this big campaign where the schools were falling apart and they needed the money and the kids were suffering da, 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 da. you know how it is so do you know which school didn't get any money after we passed all those bonds and they built gym after gym and classroom new classrooms new tracks remodeled all the landscaping you know did all kinds of stuff new cafeterias look at anna mckinney look at kynock look at yuba gardens look at linda school you just go all over all over right dobbins 50 kids you know what school campus got nothing doug eshman's mary kovalod in fact santos your wife worked there for how many years 10 years 10 years santos's wife worked there as a key key helper on campus or an aide for 10 years. Doug Eshman, who has the highest scores in the county, got the least amount of money. Now, when people say it's all about money, we're not spending enough money on kids, Doug Eshman proved that he got the least amount. He's got the, the worst facilities in Yuba County and has the best, highest performing kids. Hold that thought. Well, I had to tell you that because Doug's a great guy, and every year I'm, you know, I'm wondering is this it? Is this? A, I think he might be 72 years old, but he is. He's got some wood on the ball, and the teachers love him, and they got huge momentum over there. You know something? The teachers are really highly committed there, not just to the bulk, but like they focus. Like this article, so they focus on every kid succeeding. Sound like a Rick Teagarden philosophy back in the day. Let's see. Oh, I got to say this. You know, I was talking earlier about the State of the Union, and this guy, this John Garamendi, just sends me totally over the cliff. I want to read something that is quoted from the Appeal Democrat. They went out and asked all these people what their opinion was of the president's address. Here, this is this is our representative in Congress. This sucker is a white Obama, if there ever was one. President Trump spent 90 minutes literally applauding himself. Now, do you remember when Obama used to used to give these talks? And almost, he would say, I this and I that 150 times. And there was an article I read where Trump used the term we majority of the time. Way, way majority. I a few times. So he says, this liar, this guy's a crock of crap, this uh, Garamendi. President Trump spent 90 minutes literally applauding himself. Oh, really? Plotting. But there wasn't much for everyday Americans to be excited about. This is unbelievable. Thousand, two thousand, fifteen hundred dollar uh bonuses, tax cuts, uh factories starting up all over the place. 
this these people are so fraudulent. They're just fraud. They're liars. Contrary to cl- Trump's claims, he said job creation last year fell to its lowest rate since 2010. That is just a straight up lie. The bulk of the benefits of the tax cut he praised, he praised himself so much for, went to America's wealthiest. You know, this is really a deceptive comment because the wealthy in this country, you know. 50% of the people in this country pay no taxes. So hold that thought. I'm talking about personal income taxes. So if you're going to give a tax cut, how do you cut somebody's taxes that aren't paying any? So if the tax cuts are going to go to people that pay taxes, hold that thought. Democrats never want to like, they just tell half the truth. You know, I always love this thing when I end up in court where they say, okay, raise your right hand. They say, tell the truth the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The reason they cover that from three different directions is because people skinny by like, like, uh, the liar here, Garrett, John, the liar, Garamendi. So he praised himself so much for went. So the wealthiest and only cents on the dollar for the middle class and the working poor, the working poor don't pay any taxes, dude. Come on, man. This guy is such a jerk. Meanwhile, Trump's reckless efforts to repeal the affordable care act. Some of my friends, uh, who pay for this affordable care act, pay two grand a month for their health insurance. It's incredible. Reckless efforts. What the efforts were was saying, you don't have to buy health insurance like that anymore. Go out there and see if Joe Schmo down on the corner will sell you a little insurance. Honestly, man, we need to get rid of that guy. And you know, some of the people that work for him, John Nicoletti, suppose he, he's one of these uh, undocumented Democrats, uh, and Laura Nicholson, she's a documented Democrat. She just switched, you know, she's, is she, no, she's not for, I th- no, I think she's for Nielsen, Laura Nicholson, but you got Mary Jane Griego. I think she, she's a Democrat, but honestly, these people, well, anyway, uh, where are we here? Let me get back to my sheet. We are. Oh, I want to talk. Let me just mention we're also, uh, we're here by the grace of God, but we also need some cash. And, uh, (laughs) so one of the guys that helps us with that is elite universal security, Monty Hecker. And Monty is looking for people to go to work for him. He's working in the Yuba Sutter area, Chico Redding. And if you wanted to get involved in the guard business, and they got other jobs related to that. If you don't want to be a guard, maybe you can be a dispatcher. Maybe you can be a bookkeeper or something, something. So check out his website at universal security, elite universal security.com. All one word, seven, four, nine, zero, two, eight, zero. Go get yourself a job. Or if you want to get trained and, uh, to get into this field of work, or maybe you think of law enforcement, or you want to go into like working for the hospital. There's a lot of places you can work for being a guard, but you could take your classes from Monty. And if you go on the website, API Academy, API hyphen academy.com API Academy with a hyphen between the two.com, you can see the whole schedule of classes. And there's all kinds of cool classes that you could take, uh, and not enroll in the college. And maybe you're just finishing high school and you're not ready to enroll in the college or are there between some semesters and you could take guard card training, pepper spray, handcuffing, taser certif- certification, deescalation of force, annual security card, guard training, CCW licensing. So they have a schedule of their classes. So check it out, go get yourself a job. Or if you need a particular type of training, maybe you just want to say you're a little nervous. You hear somebody got carjacked. You want to know how to pack some pepper spray and do some business, or you, you want to learn how to shoot somebody, uh, go out there and they'll teach you how to take care of business. And somebody's trying to mess with you. So, Hey, I, I want to recommend, I think I talked about this last week a bit, but there is a great article called the price I paid for taking on Larry Nasser. The price I paid for taking on Larry Nasser in a S S a R New York times, January 26th, this year, 18, 
The Price I Paid for Taking on Larry Nasser. It's an article written by, it's an opinion piece by uh, Rachel Dolan Hollander. Quite a name, huh? Or Dole Hollander. And she was a gymnast. Today she's a full grown woman, an attorney in Kentucky. And Rachel began at some point as an attorney to uh, take on Larry Nasser, who was a gymnast doc for many years and a sports doctor. And he violated her. Uh, I won't get into, it was a lot more than just touching. It was an exam, right? And he would examine these females and under the auspices of a legitimate gynecological exam, uh, he went overboard. Let me just say that. And she realized as she got out of the exam and matured and learned about things that she had been sexually assaulted. And so she began as an attorney to document. She got letters of character reference from people. She documented and journaled uh, all these experiences with Nasser. Then, and she finally uh, took him on. And it was a pretty freaky situation. You'd think a full grown woman in her 30s, an attorney, would have. Uh, had some zip by then, but even with all her expertise and her maturity and her knowledge, all hell broke loose against her. She lost friends. Her church turned against her. I'm just shocked reading this article. Her friends, her church, a lot of stuff happened. People were not very understanding. People called her an ambulance chaser, et cetera, et cetera. Money, money grabber and looking for a payday. But because of her bravery, and her tenacity and her intelligence and how she documented and she uh, went about this in a very professional way <clears throat> and a very uh, legally sound way, hundreds of fellow gymnasts that had also been molested by him came forward and regardless of her losses and the beatings she took in the public, they put this guy, uh, they put this guy behind bars. Now, the reason I bring this up, it's a very good article. She wrote it and just submitted it to the New York times and they printed it. And, and it's very, very interesting. And I wrote an article in the territorial dispatch last week about uh, Jim Whitaker, high school PE teacher at Yuba City High School being a, uh, a released from his duties there. I'm, I almost said arrested because that's what should happen. Uh, he was released from his duties because of an accusation by a 14 year old female that he grabbed her in the butt. Uh, he claims he would, you know, anyway, I won't get into the weeds on his claims versus her claims, but there is, I think I just saw or heard there's a half million dollar lawsuit now against the, the district, uh, because of his assault, his grabbing her, like he could have grabbed her on her arm, right? If he was breaking up a fight or, or just grabbed her all around her torso and taken her down, right? Did a takedown on her or was we call a juvenile hall dipper. We just dip them, right? They call it the dip in juvenile hall. So he didn't do that. He'd have to grab her in a sexual spot. So I was talking to um, a family this week who filed a report in 1998 that uh, Jim Whitaker had touched, touched her breasts twice. And they got a copy of the report, uh, which we all wondered, is there a report? Did they just feign this? Did the district really follow proper protocol and rules to protect the children, right? And whatever happened, because nobody ever got back to her. So there was a report. It said they they confirmed what uh, 
the student said, and they took appropriate action. The question is, what was the appropriate action? Because in the file, it didn't state what the appropriate action was. Well, I said all this to say this. When asked why the, the female finally was willing to come forward and do something, she brought up the Larry Nasser case. And the very fact that this, this woman, Rachel, took on Larry Nasser. And uh, so I'm going to continue talking about this, but Wikiman says we can't do it right now. We've got some other stuff to talk about. We'll be right back. Don't go away. While we were uh, having a break, uh, we got a text from some folks that used to live here from Idaho. We got a contingency of people that have left the area because of all the California craziness and have moved to Idaho. And so we want to give a shout out to those Idaho listeners today. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you. Also, uh, Dr. Cassidy said he paid 12000 for his truck. So think about it now. Out in He's out in Linda, and they missed the – uh, misfigured his taxes. So he had to pay an extra $120, 1% of 120,000 or 12,000, $120. And, uh, then had to go fetch it back. So you folks out there in the nine, five, nine, oh, one area code, you could be out in district 10 or the foothills before you get up to Brown's Valley, like could be Loma Rica. If you buy a car, you better check and see if you're charge the correct amount. If you get overcharged, you can go get some of that back. The other thing I wanted to do with a correction from last week is I got an email after I was talking about the district attorney for Sutter County, Amanda Hopper, and the difficulties in that office uh, from the time that Carl Adams uh, tumbled out of office because of misbehavior to the election of Amanda Hopper. This There's now uh, places full of controversy. And I mentioned that uh, she had had her wages uh, garnished by the IRS because of not filing her taxes properly. And so I was corrected, uh, and what she – the wages weren't – you know, when, when the IRS comes after your wages, they just contact your employer and take them, right? The, the alternative to that is you can negotiate with the IRS and make an agreement and then they're taken out, right? So the the difference was uh, w- Wikiman is rolling his eyes on the other side of the window. <laughs> it's like the money went either way, the IRS, right? Oh, man, I hate to get letters from the IRS, right? And at least, you know, back in the day when I'd get a – I'd open my mailbox and it would be the IRS. i think, oh, like I could tell – I know my blood pressure would go, like, what's this? But at least you felt they were honest. And now we don't even have that confidence, right? You think they're going to come after all the conservatives, which they did here locally as well. But so the district attorney uh, got got sideways with the IRS. And my point last week was that when you're a government official, like when I read under the Obama administration, and it wasn't just probably his administration, but IRS officials weren't paying their taxes, a huge number of IRS people weren't paying their taxes. And a lot of their cabinet members hadn't hadn't properly paid their taxes. Remember Tim Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury? He owed thirty some thousand more dollars, right? And he said, Oh, I made it I didn't understand that. And here we're gonna put him as the head of all our money, right? Crazy. So anyway, correction on that. I also wanted to mention since we played a commercial for the trauma intervention program. If you're in Yuba Sutter counties and you'd like to get involved in a great volunteer opportunity where you actually get something done every time you're involved, you're actually doing some cool work, effective work, not just hanging around somewhere, but you're actually going out and helping traumatized individuals after a 911 incident. Could be a loss of health or a car crash or a drowning or house fire. But we have volunteers that we train from the local area, Yuba Sutter, to go out with fire, police, the sheriff, the hospital, by county ambulance, to assist them in working with all the people that are affected by an incident. So if you're interested in doing something like that, 
go to the website at yubasuttertip.org, yubasuttertip.org, or you could dial me up at 530-713-1838. Again, 530-713-1838, or you can, you can email us off the website, or there's a phone number on the website. It's a landline, but it jumps to my the same number here. So you could text me at that number I just gave you, or you could call me. Obviously, I'm not going to answer it right now because I'm talking. But uh, anyway, if you want to get involved, we have our annual training academy. Well, the reason I say it's annual, that means for you and Oliver us and Linda, once a year, annual. So uh, that starts on the 22nd of this month, just uh, a couple weeks away. So the dates and the times are listed on the website, but you can, if you give me a shout out, I will connect with you and I will email you the, uh, a handout that shows you all the dates and times as well. So you can have it right in front of you. If you're interested, uh, it's good work. And we ask after we train you, we just need you to come to a meeting once a month, a training meeting, and then you're on call for three 12 hour shifts a month where you're just available to go. You may not go if we don't have any action, but, uh, we usually do about 40 calls a month. So that's that. Okay. I want to get back to talking about uh, this Yuba city high school teacher, physical education teacher, Jim Whitaker, who's been over there for many, many years and started in the 1990s, uh, teaching at the high school and has had repeated. He said in the paper, he's quoted in the appeal Democrat, like he hasn't had any of these accusations in the past. I thought, well, that's fascinating. He would say something like that because the district knows better than that. They actually have reports. Uh, in fact, uh, there's one report that I haven't read yet, but it was kind of uh, described to me by the husband of the the woman who was uh, assaulted. And then I got contacted by a lady from out of state by email saying that she filed a report prior to that 1998 report on a on another incident. And I've asked her to come forward and file, file a, an action with the police department and with the district. And uh, so numbers of women, I've talked to two new women this week, and other women have been given me their names. I'm not seeking them out. They're calling me voluntarily because of just my involvement in the media some and maybe trauma intervention. I don't know. But uh Maybe they trust me. I don't know. But whatever you think is okay, too. So if you don't like that, fine. But they're contacting me for direction about what, what they can do. In other words, it's a Larry Nasser type response. In other words, people are emboldened. <coughs> they just finally said, you know, I'm 15, I'm 16, I'm 17, I'm graduating. Nobody's going to pay attention to little old me, right? Or they're going to, you know, they're going to pay attention to the big dog on campus Mr. Jim Whitaker, instead, he's got all kinds of power over me. Why would they believe me versus him, et cetera? You, you know how it goes, right? It's a kid. It's not an adult against an adult. It's a kid. And typically, if you've ever spent any time around court on sex cases, defense uses an, a def, defense uses a, uh, an approach or a, or a strategy called the slut and nut defense. And what they do is they try to undermine the victim by saying, actually, you have sex with all kinds of people and you're, you're immoral. And they begin to dig into their sexual past. And, uh, or they say, you're just uh, like Jim Whitaker in one of the articles was quoted as saying, it's just a hypersensitive time or super sensitive time. In other words, they, they take the defendant or the uh, accuser, the lady that or young lady that's been violated, and they say, well, you, are you sure you're just not overreacting or you're just not super sensitive or are you really balanced? You know, are, are you kind of have a history of being uh, ex overly excitable about things? Are you sure you aren't exaggerating, right? And those are the kind of, it's called the slut and nut defense amongst uh, attorneys. And either they impugn the character of the person or the, the mental acuity of the person. So, uh, so that's what's going on with this current case. Well, I really didn't grab her butt. I, 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 I bumped her knee or I, I 
bumped into her or I thought I, I, I was I was def breaking up a fight when the uh, the victim says there wasn't any fight right so back and forth we go and this is going to have to be sorted out so behind the scenes and what's not being reported in the paper because it's not come to the surface yet is there are a number of reports and from the past and either the the district is going to be reminded of them and they're going to be pulled and surfaced uh, or people are coming forward like one lady I actually talked to on the phone this week said Lou I never reported it my parents were teachers it, I was horrified I just wanted to get out of school and get away from them that was her comment and uh, she said in fact and here she's a grown woman and actually works for the district now the school district and said I just and her parents are still alive which I thought was unique and she said I finally told my parents after all these years like 20 years later what had happened to me and she's willing to come forward now I think that's we're gonna see this over and over again because uh, it's interesting the woman told me she said she assisted in one of his classes in Jim Whitaker's classes and she said Lou we knew we all referred to him as the perv <laughs> that's a bad sign that is a bad sign when kids the word on campus is he's the perv or he's the creep uh, what that is is sort of their symbolic way of saying hey watch out stay clear you know don't get alone with the dude because he's weird and so sure enough he he inappropriately touched this woman and so she's coming forward now a lot of people thought that at the last school board meeting this is after the school board meeting occurred after they put Whitaker on leave that when they voted to bring charges against him that that meant he was fired that did not mean he was fired in fact the the union uh, it was agreed to by the district obviously once upon a time but the the process to fire someone is laborious and difficult in fact it's too laborious and too difficult and so certainly people just like in the criminal realm you have due process you're innocent to proven guilty you have an attorney provided for you in the criminal process in the employment process in the union they have all those commissions appeals attorneys unions union protects their teachers etc it is an unusual in fact George Smith who used to be the superintendent of schools for Marysville Joint Unified for many years George is in his 80s I, I was on the school board at Yuba County Office of Education with George. George still is on the board over there serving as a and, – and George tells a story while we were on the board over there one day that in the 1970s, a teacher needed to be fired. It was an egregious incident, and uh, there's no question she, she should not be teaching. They fought the case. The district fought the case. They spent a quarter of a million dollars in the 1970s. That's a lot of money, a lot of money in the 70s. I mean, minimum wage is like $2 there or something, $3. A quarter of a million dollars, and they lost. So, you know, on our school board at Yuba County House of Education, we were always like leery of like going to court because it's very, very expensive and you may not get the outcome you even want so uh, so this issue uh, coming up on February 13th there's a there's uh, so they asked for at the February 13th board meeting for the uh, Yuba County Yuba City Unified School District that these charges would be would be formally presented and I don't know at that time whether they would have the f leeway to vote again and uh, sever him from the district or whether the process goes on from there but the the individual who 
has been violated, this latest case, has now uh, gotten herself, the family got an attorney, Michael Trezza, and I'll give you some some information on him in a, in a bit. But they've now filed a lawsuit against against the uh, the district, which is uh, a customary way of doing something. The district then will reject the lawsuit, which then will kick it into the insurance company. They have to formally do that. Then the insurance company takes over, and they will provide uh, the representative attorneys wise for the district to sort out what's going to happen with this lawsuit with the individual that was violated by Mr. Whitaker. Also this week, I talked to a former employee of the district who claims, uh, who stated that he had made, he was, he worked for the district for six years as a coach and made repeated, uh, complaints to the district, uh, to the, uh, the principal, to the resources officer. When I say resource officer, that would be a representative of the Yuba city police department that's on campus. He made a number of complaints. None of them, uh, amounted to any kind of discipline or certainly not his put on leave of inappropriate behavior with females. So, uh, it was interesting at that time, he said that a principal by the name of Martin Ramirez was the principal. Now he's at the, at the, uh, district office. And he said that, and he brought this up out of the blue. I know something about this cause I work a little bit with law enforcement. He brought up the fact that the resources officer, instead of doing a full blown investigation and doing a report, they would do what they call an informational report, which is a, an abbreviated report when they don't really think they, there's a crime been committed or they can verify things or that this thing is going to come to fruition in some kind of case. So they make uh, just an informational document. Another, uh, another, um, 14 year old victim who, accused Jim Whitaker of videoing her from the bottom side of her body inappropriately complained to the police. And I was told this week that the police officer, uh, did not properly investigate the case and did an informational report. So when the, the mother went to get a copy of the report from the police department, they said, we don't have to give that to you because informational reports we don't have to give, even though we have it, you can't have it. Does that, would that piss you off as a parent? I'm telling you what I, there's big old th thick plexiglass between you and the folks in that police department. I know them over there. I like them. They're nice people, but I'm telling you, if that was my girl over there, I would be looking for a way through that glass. And that ain't good PR for the police department. I was told by a law enforcement official that the guy dropped the ball and he had a, the police officer that took that report had a reputation of not doing a thorough report. And so he had a feeling his sense was there wasn't anything going to come of this. So he had to just go through the routine, took an informational report. Well, the fact is it was this 14 year old, this is three years ago. And the mother's been fighting for three years to get somebody to do something about this. This is going to be another victim. There was a, there was a report done at the district office, Yuba City Unified School District, and supposedly that mother has got a copy of the report. I haven't seen it. I haven't talked to that person, but I, I'm hearing it through other sources. There's a number of young women that have been violated, either feel like he tried to video themselves. In fact, the f former employee that talked to me said there were other cases where he videoed and supposedly the principal just told him, don't do that again. Now, honestly, people, uh, at what point when a person repeatedly gets in trouble by either getting too close to children, touching them inappropriately, like one gal, the one gal uh, at the board meeting the other night talked about him holding her back alone in the classroom, and she said, why am I, it was like the start of the year, and he, she said, why am I here? And he said, I just want to watch you do jumping jacks. 
She said she refused to do it, which I would have too. And and then he said, "Well, I'm going to send you the principal unless you do it." She says, according to her story, I "I'm fine with going to the principal. I ain't going to do your jumping jack." He said, "Well, I'm just kidding. Uh, you you can go out and play now, or with the other students." And she said, "No, I'm I'm going to I'm for all for the principal." And she never returned to the class. You know, there's some weird stuff going on here. What I call that is sexual grooming of teen girls of like, she says he had all the girls come up one by one and he whispered in their ear close enough to where you could feel his mustache. And then he pinched her on the side. You know, people, that is so totally out of bounds in my view of in, in the way you work with young people. Uh, way out of bounds. And that's what I call sexual grooming for a molestation. And for the district to not do anything about that, uh, and that's the reason I, if you want to read my article in the Territorial Dispatch, there's one online at territorialdispatch.biz. That's what came out in the hard copy paper where I talked about the, and I told the district this week, I talked to the district, I said, the big issue here isn't Whitaker. He's going to get his. Uh, either by a parent or by the system or both. But the bottom line is the district got 20 years of negligence here and is going to get a big old black eye. And so um, we got all these rules. Oh, you're a mandated reporter. You're this, you're that. We protect our kids. But they're not protecting the kids. The kids are mandated by law to be on that campus. If you don't send your kids to that campus, you will get a, you get sarbed, what they call sarbed. That means you get a, a misdemeanor offense, not sending your kids to school. And, and then the school does not take care of them. Uh, we'll be right back, and then we'll continue on with this. I All right. Well, we're talking about the incident at Yuba City High School that is just one of numerous incidences over the career of Jim Whitaker. And uh, in the article, uh, I believe that Rachel Rosenbaum wrote for the uh, Appeal Democrat, uh, Whitaker, she quotes Whitaker in a phone conversation following the board meeting, said the incident in question happened when he intervened in what he believed was a fight, one student kicking another. He said he later learned that they were playing around. He said he used his knee to nudge the student away from the other. Now, I I think I would know the difference between a nudge from a knee and somebody grabbing a handful of my butt. I just say it's just a, I don't know, it's just a, I'm not a female, but I think I could tell the difference between a knee to my hip and grabbing a handful of my butt by a hand. Uh Wicker said he self-reported the incident to the campus police, but the campus police actually haven't proved to be very helpful to kids, as well as the assistant principal. And, and uh, he said, I strongly believe, quote, according to Rachel Rosenbaum, the author of this article, I strongly believe that teachers are role models, and when we make a mistake, we should admit it and report it to make sure the process of investigation happens, according to Whitaker. Whitaker also said he believes that present society is hypersensitive that's that's a bad comment right there uh, hypersensitive and that he was taught to intervene and separate students who are fighting listen to this this is a quote i've been teaching for 26 years i've never hold hold this thought now in 26 years i have never had to face any allegations like this in the past i don't believe i should be terminated on these conditions. Now that folks, uh, he'll have to eat those words because I know of two women that have come forward that have reports on file with the district. One, two, no, there are three, two of them I talked to, but three of them I know of so far that have reports with the district, uh, of him doing improper things. So, uh, the, at the board meeting allegations against Whitaker incurred, uh, uh, 
were involving incidents alleged in 1998, 2013, and 2014. Uh, I won't go through all the details of those things. You could probably, on Facebook, you could probably watch portions of it yourself and see for yourself. Now, this is another article that, again, there's a number of articles. I mentioned I wrote one for the hard copy paper. It's on the website for territorialdispatch.biz, B-I-Z, which really talks a lot about the, the, the school district's responsibility to protect children and that each teacher has a mandated reporting or mandatory reporting responsibility to protect children. It's fascinating. If you take a poll of the teachers, they'll say, well, we all felt he was a perv or he was fussing around with kids, but nobody reported it. Now, check this out. This is from Kathy Locke at Sacramento B. This was a first, the first article they ran on this. She said the claimant alleges that she was in a physical education class on the 16th of January when Whitaker approached her without her knowledge and grabbed her buttocks. Now, what that means is the, I understand this because different people I've talked to that were on campus as employees said that he would get up really close to the backside of a girl within centimeters without them knowing it and then kind of surprise them. So Whitaker, she didn't know Whitaker was coming up on her and he grabbed her buttocks. Now that's a huge difference from a knee to the side or the knee to the hip. The claimant then says she went into the gym with her friend and reported the incident to another physical education teacher. Now this is a bad sign people. I want you to think about this. You're a physical educator. You're a teacher of any flavor over there and a student comes and reports something. Now this is what she claims the teacher said. She said, uh, the, the teacher told her that men Whitaker's age like to play around like that. I want you to think about that right there. That, that, that is, that is one sad deal. Now Whitaker is in his early fifties. So in other words, all older men can't keep their hands all of a sudden that they just, they don't have the ability to manage their hands and their behavior around young women, young girls. She said that men Whitaker's age, the, she quotes the guy saying the men Whitaker's age like to play around like that. That's what the claim says. The girls, this girl's physical education teacher that she reported this incident to failed to report Whitaker's misconduct as required by law. I heard in another report that the physical education teacher said, I didn't see it, so I'm not responsible to report it. Now, people, you know what fascinates me about schools? They're supposed to be the smartest people in our community. I, I find principals this way. Principal will do something really stupid, like a kid will bring like a Bible story book to school, and they'll say, you can't have that on campus totally in violation of their civil rights. I think, don't they train people like what, what, how to behave, what kids' rights are? And don't you know just by your own conscience that you can't, you can't get flirty or fresh or weird with children? It's like, why don't you play with somebody your own age and let them jack slap you? So, uh, Roberto Marquez, who's the attorney, he's normally a criminal defense attorney in town. He has said that uh, Mr. Whitaker is going to be totally vindicated. Uh, he's blowing smoke and collecting tens of thousands of dollars on this deal, I can guarantee you. So uh, Michael Trezza, the attorney for the young girl, said in a written statement Friday that claims that the conduct occurred while Whitaker was breaking up a fight up the fight are false. And I think that's going to be proven by other kids that were there. So the, the claim that Tretz have filed alleges that despite other red flags from teachers, here's the deal. This is a 20 year deal. I mean, we got different principals. We got various, uh, cops on campus, which are called res resource officers. We got all kinds of teachers. We got teachers that, 
just roll their eyes when you bring up Whitaker's name. Like, oh, yeah, he's a problem, right? In fact, uh, so the claim filed by Tretz alleges that despite other red flags and quotes from teachers, parents, and students, the district failed to take any disciplinary action against Whitaker or thoroughly investigate, thoroughly investigate. The police were not thoroughly investigating these incidents. Thoroughly investigate reports of inappropriate behavior. When the, when the district... When the school principal, when the administration of the school will not thoroughly investigate and get back as law states are supposed to get back to the victim and their families and explain what they did or didn't do, what they found or didn't find, and the the police do not properly investigate, you're 13, you're 14, you're 15, somebody does something weird to you on campus? Listen, people, don't you remember what it was like in those years? You have no, you have no power. You are very insecure. This woman that I talked to said, Lou, I was so insecure. Even as a senior, I just didn't, I couldn't handle the attention of going forward and reporting it. In fact, she said that Whitaker saw a boy push her up against the wall, hold her hands up so she couldn't move and give her a hickey. And, and he laughed about it. Why would people like, 15, 20 years ago, come back and tell a story like that if it was fallacious. For you and all of us, that means not untr- untrue. I want you to think about that. So, so this is acknowledging, saying, hey, teachers, parents, students, and the district failed to take any disciplinary action against Whitaker or thoroughly investigate reports of inappropriate behavior. I'm telling you, I think we're going to find dozens of reports of those that come forward before this is over. In fact, we may get them before the, we, the new board meeting comes up on the 13th. The claim alleges another student and parent com- complained to student ed- to school administrators in October 2014, alleging that Whitaker videotaped a 15-year-old girl while she was participating in a physical education class. Whitaker ale- allegedly filmed the girl's buttocks and her body from the waist down and admitted doing so when confronted by the girl and her mother. The claim is for damage half a million dollars. Whatever. The money's no big deal to me. We just we got a we got a perpetrator on campus that nobody was willing to deal. The the one employee that I talked to, f- former employee, said Lou, nobody would confront him because they were afraid of him. He was a bully. You know, it's fascinating to me. We didn't have these kind of classes when I was in school. But you run into a bully every once in a while until somebody breaks his nose. And so uh, we have all these classes now. We take time out from English, math, science, and we have class on bullying. And the biggest bully is the teachers and the administrators. The government is the biggest bully on campus and the biggest manipulator. They bring on people like Harvey, Harvey Milk Day, or you, you may be a transsexual, or you're going to have to allow boys in the girls' bathroom. You talk about bullying, baloney. So this week, I talked to the district, uh, the Yuba City Unified School District, and I had a great talk with a lady named Laura Broad, B-R-O-A-D, because I was looking for what do we do with these women who are coming forward? Who should they talk to? So Laura said, uh, I got referred to Laura after I started with a couple other people. They were all very nice, very helpful. They said, Laura Broad is the point person for taking any kind of information regarding this, this, this whole situation. Her name's Laura Broad, L O R A Broad, B R O A D. Her direct line is 530-822-7601. I'll say it again, 530-822-7601. That's her direct line to the district office, which is located on Palora off of Bridge Street in Yuba City. It's right, runs parallel to 99, Highway 99. That's where she works. And you can email her, but you have to, if you email her, leave her a message that you emailed her because sometimes in these big school 
computer systems, it'll kick you into spam if it's not used to you emailing them. And so remind her that you sent her an email if you want to send your story or or whatever. R- send a voicemail through to say, hey, I emailed you, right? So she'll look for it. So her email is L Broad, all one word, L B R O A D at Y C U S D dot org. Y C U S D U Uba City Unified School District dot org. Y C U S D dot org. Okay? So send your reports in there. Also, Lieutenant Runyon I noticed in the paper for Yuba City Police said, listen, anybody that's been has has uh have an accusation that they've been violated they're a victim no matter how long ago it was uh report it to them i called the chief friday which is always a bad deal to call government agencies on a friday because none of them hardly work none of the executives work in fact i told that to someone who used to work for the government the other day and he said lou Lou, they don't work on thursdays or fridays so but anyway, I put in a voicemail anyway, because I wanted to get some direction from Yuba City Police Department about what to do with all these folks. Do they want them to call there, no matter how old it was? So I stumbled across an article in the, one of the papers that was quoting Lieutenant Runyon, and he was the spokesperson regarding these issues, and he said, contact them. So their number over there, don't call 911. Don't do that. Just call 822-4661. That goes into dispatch, but then they, they treat it as a business call, and it's not an emergency call. So if a person's having a heart attack, let them have their heart attack, and then you, you get in next. 822-4661-530 area code. Uh, so you're going to get in dispatch. So if they act hurried, they are in a hurry. So just tell them you have a report regarding a sexual assault for Yuba City High School. You want to report, and they'll kick you over to someone else, okay? So 822-4661, that's Yuba City Police. 822-7601, that's Laura Broad at the district office. We're not talking about the high school. This is all moved to the district office now. Now, for also, for those who are victims, the attorney Michael Tretza, Michael Common Spelling, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, Common Spelling, Tretza, T-R-E-Z-Z-A. He wants to hear from you because you will become a part of the case where he's representing this, this recent victim. You can help their case even if your issue was 20 years old. What, what he's going to try to present here, I think, is the fact that the district has a, has a history of, of being nonchalant about claims by students that they were getting uh, molested, harassed uh, by Jim Whitaker. So he wants to hear from you, even if you don't want to press charges or get any money or that isn't the issue. The issue is to get a person that is being alleged to repeatedly harass, uh, manipulate, and improperly touch and whatever else i have no idea students right uh he wants to present that and what we want to do as i mentioned to laura broad when i had a nice conversation with i said laura the district has got a problem here a major problem and uh and so that was before this claim had even been publicly filed so here's Mike Tretzer. Michael Tretzer's phone number is 530 and then 673 5637. So he's in Yuba City, 673 5637. And his email is his full name, Michael Tretzer, M I C H A E L T R E Z Z A Law, Michael Tretzer Law, all one word, at ATT.net. Michael Tretza Law at ATT.net. Now, um, so I'm just looking over my notes here. 
So what I found on my own as people have con I'm not I'm not looking I'm not out trying to do the attorney's work I'm just doing my life and people are calling me and emailing me texting me so I know that prior to 1998 1998 and prior there are multiple assaults according to these women that's what they're alleging that's what they're saying some made reports some did not because they didn't think anything would be done and they didn't want to be become a person of notoriety and saying that he sexually assaulted me in fact I had a a text this morning saying he didn't really rape me so a sexual assault sounds like he raped me he didn't rape me but he touched me inappropriately and so in talking to law enforcement this week they said Lou there are hundreds of codes of different types of touching there's under under the garment touching against the bare skin there's on top of the garment touching there's you know there's touching where you have a motive for sexual advance there's touching where you just bump somebody right but an assault means any unwanted touching right so somebody touching you wanted them to touch it that's not assault it's unwanted touching then it gets into sexual areas like somebody could touch you on the chin right by socking you in the chin or you if they touch your private parts that we always teach our kids don't let anybody do that right that's sexual touching so the person said to me, Lucia, we make a public disclosure that he didn't rape us. I said, no, because it, general public's generally stupid, so they'll sort it out eventually. But it's, it's a legitimate sexual assault when it's unwanted advances against your private parts. So three years ago, t the two girls, uh, just to review, uh, so the reports 1998 and before nobody knows what punishment happened did he lose pay did he lose time on the job did he get dismissed we know he didn't get dismissed because he's still there three years ago two girls had videos taken of them in this PE class uh, they felt like he was trying to in inappropriately video their parts right uh, but it looks like they didn't take a legitimate report at the Yuba City Police Department and did an info report, so they didn't really have any. They didn't. They said we don't have to give you any report. So that parent got a report from the school. So that that those people are involved in this as well. The former uh, employee made repeated reports. Nobody did anything. They did only an informational report. He reported to the athletic director, the resource office, the administration. Nobody did Jack Deadly, according to him. That's a bad sign right there when the music comes on. I'm still talking. So let's go on. We're gonna, we'll be right back. We got a little bit of time here. We got an hour left. Come on. All right, so this is Lou Benninger. We've been talking about a teacher, a longtime teacher, <clears throat> a figure on the uh, key figure on the Yuba City High School campus, once a men's basketball coach. He's on the Sutter County Board of Supervisors who's been repeatedly turned in for inappropriate behavior, and nobody does anything about it. If you, in your neighborhood, continue to call the police about some kind of behavior in the neighborhood and nobody you don't think anything ever gets done about it even though something may have gotten done but you don't think anything's you, no one responds you just do you keep calling no you don't keep calling so one of the parents that's just a concerned parent came to the school board meeting and said if you don't do something about this to the board why would any girl ever risk her reputation and the shame of it of being accosted and all the attention to come forward they wouldn't and they don't that's why women that are in their 30s now pushing 40 some of them have talked to me said Lou I just didn't want to come forward I didn't think I'd anybody pay attention to me it's a huge thing so this previous employee at the at the uh, school who witnessed 
Whitaker over six years, reported him to Martin Ramirez, to Jim Stassi, to Joel Seaman, who's an athletic director. Stassi's been a long time, highly regarded uh, physical education coach and, and a uh, baseball coach. Uh, you know, it just, uh, folks, it just make it gives you pause. Does it not just gives you pause? So this next meeting, uh, on the 13th at three in the afternoon at the board, they will have a meeting, uh, their normal meeting, their normal monthly meeting. Well, they'll maybe make a next step in this, but some people think it's going to be over right away. It's not going to be over right away. And some people are wondering whether criminal charges will be brought. Who knows? I don't know. The Yuba City Police Department has not taken the thing seriously as far as I've been been able to sort out. and not brought. Otherwise, they would have brought charges. Or the district attorney could have brought charges. But the district attorney doesn't know about things usually until they're brought to them by some kind of a uh, law enforcement agency. They're not out snooping around town. So the big thing is that I was telling somebody the other day is he's off campus. So that's a relief, right? And the longer he's off campus, the better. Will he come back? Maybe. But you always have a a choice to move your kids, right? Um, And the problem I have with a lot of parents is they just send their kids to school and they don't check the teachers out, whether they're good teachers or not, because some aren't. Some are wonderful. Some are amazing. And some are horrible. But, you know, it's kind of like a lot of you spend more time sorting out your next car and researching your next car you're going to buy than you do your t- school teachers for your children, the most important thing in your life, right? You're like, oh, do all research on the Internet. How much is it worth? Does it have this? Does it have that? What's what's the uh, – the maintenance record on it is it is it low low maintenance da, 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 da. but when your kid goes to school a lot of you don't even check your teachers do any background on them are they any good what's the previous class think right when i went to college i knew every about every teacher were they hard were they difficult were they weird right is this an easy class i figured it all out before i took those classes right you dialed it all in some of you need to pay attention some of you need to go over there and take care of business with Mr. Whitaker, I think, with your kids. I don't, you know, maybe the district's not going to give you the kind of peace. Did you see on the Facebook where that, I felt so sorry for that father who had three daughters in gymnastics and Nassar molested all three of them. And he got so livid at the court case, he just attacked him right there in the courtroom. Did you see that, Wiki? They didn't press charges against him either. They just told him, don't do it. Don't do that no more. His poor daughters, they showed videos of his daughters. I felt so sad for them because they were just grief-stricken being in the courtroom with that guy. Sick. Guy's sickos. So it's interesting. You know, it's a bad sign on campus when a lot of kids think the teacher's a creepo or a perv. Do you think that'd get your attention? If I was if I was a principal of a campus or if I was of any place of authority in a, on a campus and kids kept referring to a teacher as a perv or a creepo, that would get my attention. That's all the red flag I'd need to have. Even if you ask them, are you a perv or a creepo? And they said, no, I'd still be concerned. Are you with me? So... My encouragement to victims out there, I don't know that a lot of people listen to the show that happened to have been over there and been violated by Jim Whitaker, but if you know someone or somebody says something as the word gets out, will you pass on the information to respond to the district, tell the story to the district? It doesn't mean you're going to be publicly exposed or go to the police department right? There's confidentiality things. So you, you can get some coverage there, the district, or you can contact me at 530-713-1838. And, and, uh, I'm, I'll be writing some articles on it as new things come up 
uh, for the Territorial Dispatch, and we'll be talking about it on this show. So uh, anyway, I'll leave, I'll leave that with you. I think we covered it. So uh, anyway, we'll move move on here. I want to play a clip for you. You know the song, America, the home of the brave, the land of the free. How free are we really? I don't think we're that free. No, we're freer than they are in Vietnam. Vietnam, you couldn't even move from place to place right after the communists took over. Now you can get up and just drive from Saigon, drive up to Da Nang or Hoi An or Nha Trang. You can just drive around, but they, they keep track of you somewhat. But uh, And we have freedom of movement around here, but we're monitored all the time. And if you want to do anything like start a business or do this, do that, do the other thing, you're, you got to ask permission all the time. Pay this fee, pay that fee, pay the, I just paid my DMV fee the other day, right? How free are we? Um, uh, this is uh, by John Stossel. All right. You interested in that? I've been in, if you've never been to Hong Kong, if you think America is pretty cool and pretty advanced and pretty modern, you have got no clue. If you go to Hong Kong, it will it will like uh, shock you. Or many many cities in China are much nicer than cities and certainly airports in the United States. Airport in Hong Kong, airport in Seoul, Korea, <clears throat> uh, much much nothing in the United States. Not one airport in the United States compares to those two airports. Uh, amazing, totally amazing airports. Singapore, the Singapore airport was once rated number one in the world. Singapore, along with Hong Kong, at one time was extremely poor in third world. Now just amazing. No country, no city in the United States in terms of modern and clean and advanced and highly high tech matches those cities. Uh, it is, uh, it, you just got to go there to catch it. You, you, you know, you may think, oh, I don't know what these, what these, it's true what he's saying. Actually, it's true. Hey, I wanted to, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I don't, uh, I haven't had a television hooked up since 87. And so I miss some things. And so I, I catch it in another fashion, like I read it or I catch it on uh, now the internet. But uh, I, I found it fascinating along with the Super Bowl activity of uh, the problem of protecting the Super Bowl from an attack. And the Super Bowl, I found, is being conducted in uh, Minneapolis in uh, St. Paul area. And Minneapolis is a city that has generated an amazing number of terror suspects. Did you know that? I thought this was fascinating. Uh, ISIS people, people that are hooked up with the Muslims, right? They've left America. They were disillusioned with America. And they've hooked up uh with these terror groups. And so um, it's Minneapolis, St. Paul areas home to the third highest number of terror prosecutions in the U S since nine 11. Uh, and the only two cities that have surpassed it, which are far larger cities is New York and Washington, DC. Uh, tw- they call it the twin cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, just like Marysville, Yuba city. And, uh, 12 Twin Cities residents have been charged with providing support to ISIS, and 20 have been arrested for alleged support of the Somali terror group uh, Al-Shabaab. Now, do you remember, I don't know whether it was Minneapolis, but you remember the Somali police officer that shot that woman dead that walked up to the car? She called the police for help, and they shot the person that called her. And she was totally unarmed, and it was a Somali guy uh that killed this woman in cold blood, as they say. So 20 have been arrested. What you think, what's up with the Somali connection? What's happened is even though we don't see a lot of Somalis around here, Somalis are Muslim. And through the Obama group, Obama just let thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of Somalis into the country. And they got no, no interest in becoming Americans. They're, they're Muslims. And 20 have been arrested for alleged support of the Somali terror group, Al-Shabaab. That's because they're Somali. It isn't like white folks, although there, is, there have been some white folks that have joined up with Al-Qaeda. So this is just over the past nine years. Between 2011 and 2014, 13 local Minneapolis, Minneapolis-St. Paul folks have died, died. They not only like 
were into this other group, these terror groups, they gave their life for them. They were fighting for Al Shabaab and ISIS, according to the U.S. intelligence people. Pretty interesting, huh? Uh, so, in order to prepare for the Super Bowl now, and in the area that it's in, which is a lot of people that are sympathetic up there, they're Muslim, etc. Uh, the FBI says it brought in 200 extra agents who are a part of 1,000 federal agents from multiple agencies composing the largest deployment in Super Bowl history, which hopefully the NFL picks up the tab on all of it, right? So the taxpayers don't have to do it. And the police departments in, in Minneapolis and nearby uh, other departments will add a, another 1,000 officers for a total of about 2,000 police and FBI uh, presence in, in the area. So when you watch tomorrow, if you decide to watch this uh, event, you can have that in mind if something goes down. So it says around the city, the FBI super, uh, the agent in charge, Brandon Grant, uh, said they'll have state, local, and federal bomb squad teams from across the region and country. Uh, Grant said the teams have brought in 16 small x-ray devices worth 35000 apiece to deploy with technicians, the largest ever such employ deployment of the technology. These devices are designed to quickly scan a suspicious bag or item or produce an image of the contents on a handheld tablet. So, right, you don't have to go through no scanner uh, or tube you stand in, like at the airport. They just, like, can, can wand you and look at the tablet, see what's inside your body. Grant said that the compact size of x-ray kits mean technicians can hand carry them in a crowd, get an image 10 times faster than the old devices. I like this. So in the air, the Black Hawk helicopters are going to be flying around and equipped with infrared cameras to surveil key Super Bowl sites so they can see whether you have a warm hot dog entering your mouth. It'll show up really good on the infrared with relish and everything, like a hot, one of those brat dogs, one of those things that gives you a heart, heartburn. The Black Hawks can also be used to move heavily armed agents to any potential attack site or to evacuate injured people to local hospitals and triage centers. So just thought that might be of interest to you as just a side note subplot to the, the super duper bowl. And, um, and to just, isn't it amazing? You've read about these white kids that decide Al Qaeda is, is, uh, their mission in life. They've, they're called to it. And these girls get over there, get raped, beat up, and then come home or get shot over there and get get their learn, learn their lesson so it's pretty fascinating but the it's interesting in certain parts of the country where syrians have been dropped in there 10 10 20 000, or somalis somalis don't know jack diddley about what's going on in america they they're just hanging out in ghettos somali ghettos is what's happening and uh in fact i got some stories i think a Nigerian guy just chopped up. Was it here or I'll have, I have the article later on. I don't know, have time for it, but a Nigerian guy chopped up a gal and, um, he's one of these illegals. So I think he's actually a drug dealer. There's some, there's some of these Somali and Nigerian and different ethnic groups that are actually slinging drugs since they got over there. They're kind of like a, uh, mafia. All right. We're coming right back. We got 30 minutes left. Okay, well, we're going to do our best to land the plane here by noon, and I think we have some sports talk guys. They had to have a good time today launching this uh, Super Bowl. I wanted to mention one more time before we leave about David Wolf from the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association uh, going to be speaking uh, at the Monday, this coming Monday night, at the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots uh, out there at Church of Glad Tidings, where they uh, are able to use a room out there and building 200 <clears throat> at 6 30 the meeting starts uh you guys in for, particularly in yuba county that are that we're going to have a fight over this one percent sales tax increase and we need to get organized and we need to get educated on some strategies and i believe david wolf can help us with that 
and he's already coming here. He's the legislative director. So pretty cool. It's good timing. And so you in Sutter County, you're next because uh, everybody's raising their uh, wages on the counties. They're expanding. They keep adding people. They keep uh, paying more and more for pensions and less and less for you and me who are paying all the taxes. So uh, go check it out. Um, 1179 Eager Road, Highway 99 at Eager. Uh, you don't have to be a member. You don't have to join anything. It doesn't cost you anything. They may have some light refreshments. They also wanted me to mention that coming up in the future, they're going to have gubernatorial candidate John Cox. Actually, he was supposed to be in town this last week for a luncheon, and he got the flu. Ugh, I hate the flu. Also, they're going to have Constitutional Sheriff Richard Mack. Listen, you may think, oh, that doesn't, that's kind of, you know, I don't know whether, what's the use of having that. Actually, the fact that, con that sheriffs are constitutional officers and they're the most powerful political person in the community means a lot to you and me. And we really need, we'll need to rely on them when the state is, is contrary, when the state is behaving contrary to the Constitution or the federal government is. We can stand with our sheriff and, and just flip them off. You with me? We can do that. So you need to understand a little bit about the Constitution. If you don't know a lot about the Constitution, it's not hard to learn about it. You can go online with Hillsdale College, and you can take an online course, or you can go online with Chris Ann Hall, K-R-I-S, and Hall.com, and you can learn from her and learn about the Constitution, and then you – Actually, it empowers you to know what's going on. So let's catch the meeting, ra rally up your troops, and you can talk about Prop 13. There are some bills coming. That they're almost every year now in, in the state capital of California, they are bringing bills to undermine Prop 13. So you that are still lingering, I know you in Idaho are probably just smiling right now thinking, I got out of there just in time. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, are the, uh, you know, I was thinking about Monty Hecker and Elite Universal Security, or I call it Elite Security for short. I notice them all the time. They're over, they, they uh, surveil or patrol this complex of businesses right near my house within walking distance it's right at the corner of 10th and e and it has a like the bank there and they got starbucks and cvs and i think there's a little sandwich shop and panda express and they got an at&t outlet the police department wasn't providing sufficient service to there and they were getting panhandled to death and their people were going elsewhere for their business because they get, were getting harassed, getting out, getting out of their car, getting in their car. So they called Monty at Elite Security, and Monty came in, and they began to discuss how, how they could better secure that place. And one of the things was that you know how when they have these big dumpsters that all these businesses throw their stuff in? Well, they had a, a block, a, a concrete block surround around three sides of it with a gate on it. But what was happening was, even though the blocks were going up like six or seven feet, people were climbing over and people were attracted to the complex because of what was in those dumpsters. And so Monty came up with the idea of putting a steel grate on the top. In other words, a, tr a roof on the top that water could get through and air and everything, but you couldn't... That, kept people out. So in other words, the gate plus the walls plus the top kept. So that was Monty's idea and it cut down on people making a mess and climbing through all the garbage over there and, and pulling it all out of the gar Anyway, uh, he solved a problem. So if you got, if you have a business and you have people that are fussing around there after you close up at night and they're vandalizing or messing around, uh, you should give Elite Security a, a shout out, and you could call them at 749-0280, 749-0280. They're in Yuba County. They're fast. They're they're really responsive. They reach out all the way up to Reading, but they're they're based here initially, and so 
you can go on their website, EliteUniversalSecurity.com, and maybe you send them an email off there. Check them out. Or you, or if you, as I mentioned, if you want to get into the guard business, you want to take some classes regarding weaponry, pepper spray, uh, de-escalation of force, all those kind of classes, check out AB, API, API-academy.com for their schooling. And, um, you know, uh, I'm into privatizing as much as we can and just leaving law enforcement for the heavy lifting. Somebody gets murdered, they investigate it, right? But but let's shrink the size of the public sector so we aren't stuck for all these pensions that we're going broke. You got it? If Did you see that uh, where they're talking about New Zealand, they shrunk spending and they shrunk expenses? I think it was New Zealand they were talking about. And, and the whole place began to flourish, right? More freedom. Get out of people's business. Sh- shrink reg- regulations. Um so there you go if you need if you need uh security business try monty you know uh there's been all this angst about the ice you know ice we used to call it what we, what it used to be called the in used to be called naturalization ins used to be called ins immigration naturalization service but you know every time every once in a while people want to change the name so they change it to ice uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement, Immigration Customs Enforcement, ICE. And so now we've had, even before Trump came in, ICE began to raid businesses. Did you know that? Under Obama even. And people, I remember, really reacted because they raided a lot of 7-Elevens, right? You shopped, everybody knows 7-Eleven. Everybody shopped at 7-Eleven. And, uh, you know, some people like those Slurpees and stuff. I used to go into 7-Eleven when I went to a prayer meeting, early morning prayer meeting at 6, uh, out at Glad Tidings. I'd go and get coffee. I wouldn't even take – I'd just hose my face off and get out there and go get a cup of coffee at, at 7-Eleven and uh, go, to the, go to the meeting. But they've been raiding 7-Eleven, so people said, oh, those stinking ice people. Her, her. Well, the fact was – these 7-Eleven franchisees have been doing criminal stuff, and they've been slinging drugs. They've they've been hiring illegals, and then they don't pay them, or they pay them they pay them like it looks like they paid them by the paperwork, but then they demand that the employees give them part of the money back. Did you know that, Wiki? They so they say you're going to work here. I'm going to pay you this, but but we want money back, and then they would house these illegals in houses like my friend Wayne Fortin who runs trauma intervention in Orange County he says Lou there are houses in Orange County that they're flying pregnant women in from other countries like China and stuff and they pay like ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars to stay there until they have their baby like the last month or two and then their baby then becomes an anchor baby a citizen of the United States right and they get a free free delivery at a a top Orange County hospital. It's a whole scam. So what these 7-Eleven franchisees were doing is they were renting a house and they were bunking all these illegals there who then would work at their deal for dirt cheap, right? So you think, oh, why don't we just let these people come in here and do whatever they want, illegal, and, hey, it's up to them, it's their life, leave them alone. Well, the fact is they were getting ripped off by these unscrupulous business owners and uh, so a guy named Farouk Bag. and I want you to say that's not an Irish name right or a German name Farouk B-A-I-G Bag, was sentenced to 87 months in prison uh, guilty plea he did a guilty plea to committing wire fraud and concealing and harboring illegal aliens Employed at 7-Eleven. Uh, franchi- and and it, it, he had a series of stores in Long Island and Virginia, the state of Virginia. And so check this out. You think, oh, this is no big deal. All these people coming in here. Check this out. <laughs> Using 7-Eleven brand in our neighborhoods, the defendant exploited his alien employees, stealing their wages and requiring them to live in an unregulated boarding house. He now faces time in prison 
da da da, cheated everybody, ripped people off. He he was stealing the identities of children and even dead people. In other words, he stole identities, and to get these people fraudulent identities, right? So this uh, attorney for the uh, Justice Department said, we are committed to preserving the rule of law and protecting our communities from abuse of corrupt businesses seeking to gain illegal advantage. I would like to thank uh, our partners. They list a bunch of agency. But anyway, it says, today's sentencing holds Farouk Beg accountable for knowingly stealing identities to hire and employ illegal workforce. He also stole more than $2.6 million from his overworked and underpaid employees. Uh, this case serves as a stern reminder about the consequences facing employees who exploit Ill See, what's happening is these illegals not only are legitimate workers not getting the job, honest people that would take that job, but they're, they're not getting the opportunity for the job, but they're hiring illegal alien labor and violating nation, our nation's laws. In other words, they're, they're stealing their money. According to court filings, the facts rep, uh, presented in court, the defendant who owned and managed and controlled 14 7-Elevens, guy owned 14 7-Elevens, uh, he hired dozens of illegals, equipped them with more than 20 stolen identities, housed them at residences he and his co-conspirators conspirators owned and stole substantial portions of their money during the scheme check this out the defendant generated 128 million dollars in proceeds come on man you think this isn't a big deal you think oh it's no big deal just let them stay let them do this you people you just don't know what you're even talking about in addition to the sentence of imprisonment this court entered an order forfeiting the defendant's rights to 10 7 they just took his stores right from him just like cleaned his clock man this unbelievable so you think it's just here so uh, anyway there's one other one here i just uh let me just do this one <clears throat> so this guy is malik yusuf 55 sentence at the u.s district court in central islip after pleading guilty, uh, he had uh, five 7-Eleven franchise stores uh, in Virginia and Long Island. He got 48 months for same thing as the other fella. He hired dozens of Ill illegal immigrants, provided them same thing, same, same, same. Totally ripped people off. I think it was the same thing. This is just a different guy getting sentenced. But... Uh, it's a huge deal. So you see these ICE people going in. There's something other than just illegal aliens there. What they they just did a sweep to 77 businesses in Northern California, and what they do is they present them with a letter of audit, and they give them so many days to get their paperwork in order. In other words, who's working here, and let let us see your I-9 forms. And some some of you liberals said, "Oh yeah, they're harassing them. I have to have I-9 forms." Listen, when every, whenever I go to work for a place, I had to fill out a W-4 form, right? Remember, W-2s is what you get where they tell you how much you were paid over the last year so you can file your income tax. W-4 is where you tell them your Social Security number, married, single, how many dependents you have, how many exemptions you want, so they can know how much to withhold out of your check, right? So you all fill out a W-4 form, and I-9 just simply – uh, affirms to the business, they swear, the person swears that they're a citizen. What's, what's the big deal about that? What's wrong? You know, it's amazing to me. I go to Vietnam all the time. And when they told me when my visa was screwed up one time, they said, Hey, I said, it's your fault. You made the mistake. I paid for the visa. They just wrote it out wrong. They said, Hey, tough, go get another visa or get on the plane. They didn't ask me whether I was smart whether I was a nuclear physicist, whether I was the best like facial surgeon in the West, they didn't care who I was. They just said, get on the next plane and fly back to Hong Kong. You can do that or you can pay us all over again and we'll let you get a visa right here, right now. Otherwise, you're out of here, partner. They didn't care who I was, whether my last name was Bush or Clinton or anything. They just said, you're out of here. So now 
I was talking earlier. Here it is, a 29-year-old Nigerian migrant d drug dealer, right? That's a bad sign, Nigerian migrant drug dealer. That's a bad combo right there. He'd been arrested by police. This happened in Italy. Uh, and we got him over here as well. The co Italian commune of Polenza, after being accused of killing an 18-year-old girl, chopping her into pieces. Now, I don't know what gets into a person. It's one thing to kill somebody. I mean, I've thought about that before. I thought, could I kill somebody? Chopping them up, now that takes it to a whole nother level. Does it, is this too, uh, that you feel the same way? I think chopping a person up. My dad used to be a butcher, so I ran the saws, you know, where you saw the legs of the cows and everything. You saw them up, run those big bones through and chop them up for dogs so dogs can chew them up and stuff. Like, I've worked on those band saws, and I've, I've made hamburger. But running a person's leg through a band saw and chopping them up, now that, that just, I don't know what, what's in me, but it just doesn't, it, it sets off the warning signals or something. Anyway, this is the type of people that we're bringing into our country. Europe is ahead of us. They have perfected being stupid over in Europe. They are letting all kinds of people that have no, no interest in Italy, Europe, looking good, foxy women, perfume. They got no, all they want is women draped in cloth that they rape with burkas on and stupid stuff and Sharia law guys can screw anybody they want guys gals can't you know all the double standards for men on these deals guys can have three you know f five year old boys that they have sex with girls can't right all that stupid stuff uh that's the type of people we're letting in this country when we do this visa lottery or visa mig you know this uh chain migration stuff it's crazy just crazy stuff now these DACA, I, I mentioned earlier about DACA recipients busted at the Texas border, I think by Laredo, smuggling their human trafficking. That's your wonderful people that are studying and, and going to be the next generation dreamers. You know, you know it's like calling uh, chopping a baby up, being planning your pregnancy, right? Chopping your baby up. That, that's a healthy thing, according to Planned Parenthood, you, called euphemisms. So this is uh, these are dreamers that are human trafficking. <clears throat> and uh, so agents identified Mexican national, a Mexican national who received temporary protected status under Barack Obama's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. And agents also determined the two passengers as illegal immigrants from Mexico being smuggled into the U.S. Agents arrested the driver and the two nationals. The DACA recipient will likely face federal human smuggling charges. That's your DACA, folks, right, all you people. I get a kick out of them. You know, I think if I was DACA, I would say, hey, we just really love it here. You've been so kind. Thank you, Jesus. We, we're thinking about going to church. Uh, we we don't have any b bad background. Please give us a chance. We really appreciate all the kindness you showed us, all the benefits. No, instead they flip you the bird, and they say F Trump, and they fly the me Mexican flag. I don't know how that – now that may win over Gutierrez and Chucky Schumer, but I'm telling you what, to get the, the sympathy for the American, the average American – hard-working people that are paying taxes that day that hit hit just like socking somebody in the eye and then pouring salt in it so the arrest of these guys they see they seized their car a ford focus which wasn't any big gain the arrest marks the fourth daca recipient or former protectee to be arrested uh, in less than a week on the border two days before a texas incident yuma sector border patrol arrested Another Mexican national with DACA status. Agents found four illegal immigrants from Mexico in his pickup truck. Uh, so on January 27th, just the other day, San Diego sector agents arrested a Mexican national under DACA status after he admitted working as a scout for a human smuggling operation. Uh, unbelievable. Did it surprise you on that? Oh, oh, let me see when we got one more. Oh, here we got another one. January 24th, another DACA recipient on charges of human smuggling uh, as well. So did it surprise you at the San Diego border? They arrested 600,000 people. 
Holy mackerel, man. Uh, where they got the fence up there now? 600. Was that one year or something? I was just like, those people are working their fingers to the bone down there. Uh, freaky. Now, if you think, I, you know, I like Mexican people. In fact, I considered in 1987, I thought, I'm going to move down here to Mexico because I was doing some work down there in Otay Mesa side of Tijuana. We were building a an orphanage. We were adding on 4,000 feet to an orphanage, and I thought, I kind of like it down here. And uh, I was learning the language, and I liked the food, and I just liked the, I liked the people. But they got a gnarly side to them in Mexico. There's a violent side. And uh, when you when you have these illegals, it's one thing if you vet them and you figure out, do you know English? What kind of education do you have? Do you got some fu funky disease? But when you just have these people breaking in, oh, we only got a minute left. I was getting on a roll here. All right. So maybe I better do this. We'll, we'll post. I'm just telling you this is bad news. I was going to tell you about a bunch of murders down in Veracruz, hundreds of them, people digging up bodies. That's the kind of people you want to let in. We're out of time. These sports guys are going to prep you, I think, for the Super Bowl. And uh, I'm out of here. We're coming back next week, Lord willing, and we're going to do a live three-hour show. So the party's over. Do something good for somebody this week. It might be an angel that you're doing, you're connecting with. See you later.